<clears throat> Welcome, and thank you for joining us for week three of Beyond the Border, the realities of migration from Central America. My name is Tom Hare, and I'm a senior researcher in the Pulte Institute for Global Development at Notre Dame, where I co-direct the Central America Research Alliance. In this, our final event of the series, we will explore what the United States, businesses, the church, and each of us as global citizens can do to create safe, dignified paths for migration. And for those with uh, joining us today with Notre Dame ties, you will note that it is fitting that we are rounding out this series on Founders Day, a day in which the Notre Dame community takes a step back to consider our history, understand the present, and imagine the future. That is exactly what we've been doing with regard to the topic of migration from Central America over the past few weeks. For those that were with us in the first week of the series, we focused on the realities in the region from the viewpoint of researchers looking at challenges such as unemployment, gender-based violence, and others, other drivers of migration. Last week, we invited two of my friends and co-authors from Central America to join us and reflect more on the personal side of things and how they develop, view development in the region as Central Americans. We approach the series in this order somewhat instinctively as researchers who hope to inform and provide evidence for action. First, we presented the evidence, then we contextualized that evidence with firsthand experience. And now today, we're just, just, we will be discussing how that evidence can be used to inform action from various angles. And that is exactly what we hope to do at the Pulte Institute and in the Central America Research Alliance, promote evidence-based policy and programs to support human development. Now, both those who joined us in the past and those joining us for the first time today should have received links to some of that evidence um, and evidence that we've generated over the past few years um, with regard to Central America. And please let our organizers know via the chat if you have any questions about finding those materials on the Think ND or Pulte Institute websites. Also another housekeeping note, as I mentioned before, and, but because we have new folks joining us each week, it bears noting again that the topic of migration can be debated from many sides. Our purpose in the series has not been and is not to convince you of one viewpoint or another but rather to inform and discuss. You will note that the program is intentionally titled Beyond the Border. And while we cannot ignore the real challenges of security and human rights at the border, and indeed today we will get into, into legal immigration processes that are impacted by realities in the region. Our focus during this series has been on the region and the realities that Central Americans face that are so difficult that many are forced to leave their homes in search of a better life elsewhere. So we have a great group of guests today. I'm gonna to dive right into their brief introductions and then get the discussion going with them. These are very accomplished individuals and it would take pretty much all of our time today just to introduce them. So please see the ThinkND site for the, their full bios. But here's a, a brief synopsis. First, Michael Camilleri serves as Senior Advisor to the U.S. Agency for International Development Administrator and is the Executive Director of USAID's Northern Triangle Task Force with a focus on Central America. Michael was most recently Director of the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. And prior to that, he served in the Obama-Biden Administration as the Western Hemisphere Advisor on the Secretary of State's Planning policy planning staff, and as Director for Indian Affairs at the National Security Council. Michael holds a BA in History from Notre Dame and a JD from Harvard Law School. We're also joined by Deva Skumra, who's a partner at Stone, Grisgoric, and Gonzalez. Ms. Skumra has been certified as a specialist in immigration and nationality law through the State Bar of California Board of Legal Specialization since 2015. She has a great depth of experience in family-based immigration, immigration litigation, and the analysis of immigration consequences of criminal activity. And she also directs much of the firm's pro bono work. 
Ms. Coomer earned, earned her JD from the University of Washington. We also have Father Daniel Grudy, who is an Associate Professor of Theology and Global Affairs. He serves as the Vice President and Associate Provost for Undergraduate Affairs and is a Fellow and Trustee of the University of Notre Dame. Father Grudy is an internationally recognized expert on migration and refugee issues, including authoring or editing several books, serving as executive producer on multiple films, and work with the US Congress, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, the World Council of Churches, the Vatican, and the United Nations on issues of theology, globalization, migration, and refugees. Father Grudy earned his bachelor's degree from Notre Dame, a Master of Divinity and a Licentiate in Sacred Theology from the Jesuit School of Theology, and his Doctorate in Theology from the Graduate Theological Union. And last but not least, we're also joined by Dr. Juan Jose Debu, who is the founder of Think Huge, a direct investment council for the US and Central America. Dr. Debu was the founding CEO of the Global Adaptation Institute, co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Climate Change, and the vice chairman of the Dorado Group. Dr. Debu was also previously the managing director of the World Bank, where he oversaw operations in Africa, the Middle East, East Asia, and Latin America, and was responsible for the oversight of the Human Development and Sustainable Development Networks. Prior to the World Bank, he served concurrently as El Salvador's Minister of Finance and as Chief of Staff to the President. He also held high government positions in El Salvador for an additional 12 years, working for three different administrations without belonging to any political party. Before his work in the public sector, Dr. Debu led the expansion of his family-owned businesses and worked with nonprofit organizations on public policies to promote liberty, stability, and growth throughout Latin America. He holds a PhD in industrial engineering from North Carolina State University. So we have a great lineup here and I don't wanna waste any time uh, getting to, to hear from them. And I'm excited to share this time with them and with you all. Um, but before we begin, one last note, we ask that you use the chat function to submit any questions you might have for our speakers throughout the dialogue. As questions come to mind, please go ahead and, and enter them. We might address them at that moment, uh, soon after, or at the end of our, of our discussion. And we'll do our best to address as many of those questions as time allows. So without further ado, let me turn to Michael. We'll start with you, Michael. And as we heard in your bio, you have an impressive record of government service with a particular focus on Latin America. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started working on Central America specifically? Sure, Tom, thanks so much for having me. Great to be uh, back in Notre Dame, even if it's virtually and, and great to, to be with you and my fellow, fellow panelists. Um, so uh, my interest in Central America actually was, was born uh, of a project that was assigned in high school on liberation theology. And um, I say it was assigned to me because at the time I had no idea what liberation theology was, but it, it sort of led me uh, sulking off to the library to find any books I could on, on, the, on, the, on the issue. Um, and then led me down you know, more of an intellectual journey um, in which I was exposed to uh, some of the history of Central America and, and, and Latin America more broadly, um, certainly exposed to um, patterns of repression that, that took place during the Cold War uh, as well as issues of U.S. foreign policy uh, as it pertained to the region. Um, and, and I was able to pursue um, some of those intellectual interests while I was at Notre Dame uh, studying history. I uh, wrote um, a couple of long papers my senior year, one on the 1954 coup in Guatemala um, and another on the Iran-Contra affair in, in Nicaragua. Um, at the time, I had actually never been uh, to Latin America. I had studied um, in the Notre Dame program in Toledo, Spain, so I had picked up some Spanish um, during my time at, at Notre Dame and away from it, um, uh, but had kind of this, this, this crazy idea that I wanted to go to law school and become a human rights lawyer and, and focus on Latin America. Um, and actually was able to do that. Um, so I, I um, managed to spend, while I was in law school, some time in Central America. And then uh, to the great disappointment of my parents, uh, when I graduated from law school, uh, turned down uh, big, big firm offers and, and went off to Guatemala on a fellowship uh, to work with a group of human rights organizations that were at the time, conceiving of something that 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 sounded um, pretty lofty and 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 exotic almost, um, but became 
uh, a really groundbreaking experiment in, in kind of national, international cooperation to combat impunity and corruption. And that was, of course, the, uh, the CICIG mission in, in Guatemala, which over the course of a decade or more uh, in that country um, proved that you could bring together the best of kind of local capacity with international expertise to dismantle criminal networks and, and, and take on uh, corrupt politicians and, and, and build the rule of law, even in a, in a place where it was quite fragile. And unfortunately, that experiment ended a couple of years ago, but I think we all look back at that as a, a really valuable experiment and one that it continues to inform uh, a lot of thinking in the region and internationally about what the international community can do um, to support local actors working on, on rule of law issues. Um, I, uh, I, I moved back to, to the States, and, and uh, but stayed connected really uh, in every um, role I had subsequent with, with the region. Um, years later, I was a lawyer at the American Commission on Human Rights uh, and had the opportunity to be um, the lead staff lawyer on a, a, a case that may mean something to, to folks joining us was the, the Diario Militar case, um, one of the most emblematic cases from the Guatemalan civil conflict, um, which involved the, the forced disappearance of um, over 180 uh, uh, purported political opponents um, during the, the years of the Dirty War in the early 80s in, in Guatemala. Um, so all of this is obviously incredibly meaningful um, to me, having started my career kind of on the ground working with uh, civil society groups in, in, in Guatemala. Um, and just to, to come back to your, your original question, I, I have had the opportunity uh, more recently to serve in a, in a variety of roles in the Obama administration and now uh, at USAID and the Biden ad administration. Um, and and I'm, I'm very much shaped by both the, the kind of intellectual grounding um, in, in the region, um, uh, by um, you know my experience in the human rights movement, but I think as much as anything, by just the, the time I've spent in the region working with um, grassroots activists and, and community leaders uh, and seeing things from, from their perspective and trying to bring that now um, to the work that we're doing at, at USAID. And, and we are, um, I think, under the Biden administration, making a really historic commitment um, to the countries of Central America, and particularly uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and, and Honduras. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance, Tom, to, to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but grateful for the chance just to, to tell you a little bit about my own background. Yeah, thanks for that, Michael. And I think that's so, you know, I relate to that too, in the formative years of your life, having those experiences where you're exposed to something completely different. Um, and then and having that really shape the trajectory of your career, you never know where it's going to lead. Um, but, it, and in particular, when you mentioned the, the CICIC, the, you know, the, the anti-corruption initiative in, in Guatemala that, that unfortunately did close, it's certainly something we hear a lot more about is, you know, what, what, can be done, what else can be done to, to combat corruption at the regional level, at the national level in Central America? And, and what influence does that, that level of, of um, you know, lack of transparency impact development in the region? So I think, you know, that's kind of a good segue into a, a follow-up for you is, you know, now, now that you're there, you're using that past experience uh, to, to advise the USAID administrator and the administration you know, what is the U.S. government doing currently in Central America? You know, where, where do you see it moving in the next couple of years? And, and how has that evolved over the past few years? Yeah, sure. I, I, I'll preface this by saying I have the great fortune of working for a USAID administrator who's also a, a human rights lawyer. And so uh, we, we tend to see eye to eye on, on a lot of things, which is, uh, and, and, you know, she's obviously extraordinary and, and brings a lot to uh, to the role, um, given given her background. So, um, look, the the, the Biden uh, administration, President Biden, Vice President Harris, are are absolutely committed to building uh, a safe, orderly, and humane uh, immigration system. Um, um, but they also understand that um, to really kind of get at this challenge, we need to be focused on the root causes, um, the reasons why we're seeing hundreds of thousands of people. Um, fleeing their countries, you know, making an incredibly perilous uh, journey to our southern border. Um, many of them from uh, the, the, the Central American countries that, that I mentioned and that I'm focused on uh, at USAID. So, um, you know, it's, it's abundantly clear to us that, that most of these people, um, all things being cool, would not want to abandon their, their countries and their families and their communities. Um, um, they're doing so in, in most cases out of a sense of, of desperation, whether that's economic desperation or insecurity or uh, simply a sense that, that you know, that the government's um, 
that uh, that rule their countries are 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 so self interested and corrupt that, that ultimately they, they they don't have any hope that things are going to get better. Um, and and this is is really shaped the um, the president's commitment um, to invest four billion dollars over four years uh, in Central America, uh, focused on the northern triangle countries, um, in order to to help generate sustainable living conditions for uh, people in the region. Um, the strategic framework that we've developed to to kind of guide the the implementation of this funding, which we're hoping to get from from Congress over the next four years, um, is called our root causes strategy. Uh, and under that strategy, uh, we're working to promote inclusive economic growth, uh, to strengthen democratic governance and combat corruption, uh, to defend human rights, to improve uh, citizen security, and to combat uh, gender-based violence. Um, and under the strategy, we'll be looking um, to address both the, the sort of acute factors um, that uh, that impact irregular migration things like natural disasters and water and food insecurity, um, exacerbated in many cases by, by climate change, as well as these kind of longer term chronic challenges um, that, that, I, that I spoke to, including poverty, uh, insecurity, and, and poor governance and, and, and corruption. Um, you asked about kind of how this, you know, how this differs from, from, from prior efforts to, um, uh, to, to, to deal with, with, with this challenge. And I think it's, it's a good question because um, President Biden himself, when he was vice president, led in 2015 and 2016 a, a kind of you know a, an early version of this strategy unfortunately um you know during the the intervening years the trump administration at one point actually cut off uh, assistance to to this region and so we're, we're we're kind of in a process now where we're still trying to restart some programs that were cut off uh, at that point but if we if we if we kind of look back to uh the 2015 2016 period um i'd say there are kind of three Three things that there's a lot of continuity, and that's that's logical, I think, based on the fact that we're dealing with the the same reason. But I, I would point out just just quickly, kind of three things or, that I think are are mark an evolution uh, from where we were a, a few years ago. Um, the first is the strategy itself, um, and so we're um, you know we're continuing to focus on inclusive economic growth, on security and governance, um, but we're also redoubling our our focus on gender gender based violence uh, and the impacts of climate change. Uh, which were not so prominent in, in the prior strategy. We're also, um, you, you, I think, referred, Tom, to kind of, you know, evidence-based policymaking. We're very data-driven at USAID. So we are, we're using the lessons learned from past experience. We're using um, the data we get from a variety of sources, including IOM and CDP and the, the focus groups that we're doing on the ground uh, to inform these efforts to assess what's working and what's not and to, to sort of iterate and evolve our efforts going forward. So that's the sort of strategic piece. Um, um, the, the the second thing is is kind of the scale of this, right? I, you know, I mentioned the the four billion dollar figure. We've never invested uh, anything quite like that in terms of scale in, in this particular region to try to address uh, the root causes of why people are are feeling like they, um, you know, their best future lies elsewhere rather than in their their home communities. Um, and then the final thing is is sort of the sustainability, right? Which ultimately is going to be critical. I think we all understand. You know, we hope that there are things we can do in the shorter term that have an impact on, on people's lives. Um, but we all understand, I think, that, that many of these things are long-term challenges. And so this can only be successful if we can sustain it uh, over time. Um, and, and on that score, you know, I think it's important to point out that we, we don't see development assistance as a panacea. Um, we, you know, we're looking at expanding partnerships with, with the private sector, with civil society, with faith-based groups, with, with those who are going to be on the ground for the long term and can have the kind of longer term impact uh, that we're looking for. Um, but ultimately, we're also very clear eyed about the need for domestic political will. Um, and, and that is why governance is, is so central um, to, to our approach. And we talk, sometimes we talk about it kind of about as, as a first among equals in the five pillars that I mentioned of this strategy, whether it's, you know, promoting private investment, whether it's, you know, safer schools or, or safer streets or better schools or, or cleaner water, you know, all of these things become more difficult, uh, if not impossible, in an environment of, of endemic corruption and state capture. And, and, and that, unfortunately, um, is, is what we're seeing uh, in Central America in, in, in some cases uh, and governance trends that, um, uh, that are troubling, frankly, in different ways. But, but in all, all three of the countries, we've taken some actions as an administration uh, to respond to those trends and, and make very clear uh, kind of what our expectations are. This is an administration that, you know, is, is deeply, deeply committed to partnering uh, with the people uh, of Central America to try to build the hopeful future in the region um, that, that they want to see uh, and that hopefully their governments want to see. But we really do 
you know, we want to be met by um, government to government partners uh, in the region that share our commitment to rule of law, to accountability, to transparency. Um, and, and, and we, you know, we will we will approach that with the seriousness um, that it deserves. And I think our actions so far uh, are evidence of that. Um, so I'll stop there, Tom, for now. Happy to come back to any of this. But thanks. Thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks a lot, Michael. And, and we'll loop back to you. Um, I already see a couple of questions coming in that that are good ones about kind of linking that, especially the grassroots with the work with governments and, and things. So thanks for that. And the other thing I wanted to highlight, too, is, you know, when we talk about four billion dollars is a lot, it's a great investment, but it's also an, uh, in the region. It's an investment against what's being spent in other ways on migration, things like securing our border is, you know, $26 billion a year thereabouts. Um, and so, so the work that, you know, relatively smaller investments in the region, while not, it's not going to fix everything, as you mentioned, it, it should pay some dividends in the long term in terms of reducing um, what's happening at the border and, and, and the, the expenses that are incurred with that. And the other way we do that too is, is through having legal processes to to bring people who have um, you know who have reached the border or from are are seeking asylum or refugee status from from elsewhere um, and coming to the United States. So I think that's a good segue to bring bring Theba in. Um, but and before we get into that, maybe just to get to know you a little bit better, um, Theba, about you know how did you you have a very specific part of of law that you're looking at and working on. Um, how did you get started working on immigration and asylum? Was there a particular moment or event that that led you to this career track? Sure. Um, I guess my first introduction to the particular struggles of immigrant communities was as the daughter of immigrants. Um, and so that was, you know, getting to see the the limitations of being without status, of the inability to travel to you know, parents' funerals or siblings' weddings or just the fear. Um, and then, like Michael, you know, as I was uh, considering law school, I certainly wanted to become an international human rights lawyer and, uh, and then settled on asylum as that international human right that I was most focused on, and especially with regards to women and children. Um, and so I became very excited when there was... Uh, a case that finally established female genital mutilation as a basis for protection. And it signaled to me uh, the opening of a door towards more gender-based asylum theories. And that's what I wanted to be a part of, of expanding that opening. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, immigration became this very natural um, area of law where I could pursue uh, international human right here domestically and 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 serve beyond asylum clients as well and serving families who've been here uh, you know for 20 years and and longer um, and certainly you know working here in the US Central Americans comprise a significant portion of my clients um, and so those include people who may be arriving just now at the border or people who've had temporary protected status now for 20 years. And um, also, you know, we're fleeing various disasters or wars and violence at that time. So that's been a very rewarding field for me, actually. It's, it's a bit of a calling, I would say, um, working with these families and, and living their fears, living their aspirations and, um, you know, for, for, for them, for their children, and seeing the difference that it makes, you know, for generations. Um, that's, that's been why I came to immigration and why I'm still with it. Great, great. Yeah, thanks. I think those, I mean, as with Michael, and, and, and I've shared in previous series, you know, my kind of journey and my life journey, and it, it's always amazing how we can find something that, that aligns with our, our deep passions and our, you know, and as you say, our calling um, and discern that, that process as, as we go along. Um, so on this, you know, on the topic of, of asylum, and I had the, it was a great learning experience for me a number of years ago, translating for an asylum case as it went um, through the asylum hearing process. And so I got to see firsthand, you know, one time through this, and you've been through this multiple times, but one time, the level of, you know, of 
of documentation, the level of charting the life course of each of this was a family of each of these family members as they went through this process and, and saw the rigor with which it was approached. Um, could you talk, kind of walk us through, you know, in particular in broad terms, you know, what is, what is the asylum process? You know, what are, how has it changed or evolved over time at all? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we're hearing a lot too, you know, kind of a second question about um, this, you know, Title 42 and, and people not having the opportunity to be, to apply for asylum. How has that impacted your work and what's happening, particularly for Central Americans? Sure. So there are different paths of applying for asylum. Um, you know, people may arrive here legally with some status and then um, they would be required within their first year of being here to apply for asylum um, and, and show what their, why they have either past, suffered past persecution or they have a well-founded fear of future persecution. And that needs to be on account of a protected ground, um, race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And that their, their country is um, unwilling or unable to protect them. That's the basic definition of a refugee um, under the, and that's, through our statute that's adopted from the Refugee Convention. Um, the, the process of applying can be very difficult and that's become slower over time. You know, right now, even the most basic and you know, what one might consider a slam dunk kind of case would, would, is winding at at least five years, you know? Um, and, and that's just through the asylum office alone before even reaching uh, perhaps an immigration court. If, if the asylum office itself cannot make that decision, they will refer the case to an immigration court, which will add on at least three years probably at this point um, to, you know, to a, that's a single applicant. Um, so what we're seeing within the asylum office process is is still a more humane you know way of dealing with it people can at least who are who have managed to arrive here legally and are able to live here and um, eventually perhaps get a work permit and and start you know the semblance of living um, you know while they're waiting this interminable time for for a decision um, separately are the people who are arriving at the border and those people are going through a wide variety of processes uh, you know there's the migrant protection protocol that was started to return people back into Mexico and have them wait there to be processed to attend hearings well, you know in the US and has resulted in in a lot of chaos um, the the current administration has been ha, was trying to wind that down um, and then the courts decided that the process of winding that down was improper and so you know it's it's a, there's a lot of back and forth of how how hearings will be happening for a lot of those people who were enrolled in that program. Um, the Title 42 process you mentioned is, is another method of keeping people out and um, unable to apply for asylum. And unfortunately, this administration is continuing that um, by, uh, by uh, just, just last, at the end of September, um, the, a district court had ruled that it was uh, an improper process and should not be continued. Uh, unfortunately, the administration is appealing that decision and has obtained a stay from the district, uh, from the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, excuse me, on the injunction. What, what that means is that process of, of keeping people out uh, on the grounds of public health concerns, whether or not they show any signs of COVID infection or anything is continuing. Um, and this is for families. Uh, it excludes unaccompanied minors through previous lawsuits, um, but it means that entire families are shut out. And then what we're seeing as a result is repeated attempts from those people to come into the border, come past, to be able to assert their right to seek asylum. Um, so it's, you know, what, what, and then it, which of course raises the cost of border security, right? As people make multiple attempts, they have multiple contacts with, with border patrol. Um, and, you know, it, it, it complicates their cases that much more. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing. And it sounds even more complex than I think I had imagined before in terms of of the message that's being sent and received about you know what what does you know, not only what what would fulfill the requirements for asylum, but what would the process look like? It sounds like there's still a lot of uncertainty and uh, movement in in that. So um, let's come back to that in a second. I'd like to bring in in Father Father Grudy. Um, you know, just from a, a almost a, not a completely different perspective, but a you know a little bit different perspective that you've been examining migration refugee issues globally um, from a, a theological perspective for a number of years. Um, what was your path to getting involved in migration issues, and and what are the kind of the roots of this link between theology and migration or, or refugees? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, I found this is you found me more than I found it. And it started when I was an exchange student in high school and I went down to, to Uruguay and Argentina. And the family that I live with were, um, had a son who had disappeared during Argentina's dirty war. And I can remember just how much it struck me. Uh, uh, two sides. Uh, one was the tremendous hospitality that they showed me and also the injustices that they underwent uh, in their country and more particularly in their family. So that um, planted a seed in me to want to work on, <clears throat> excuse me, work on something more globally, <clears throat> but also to address some of the injustices going on in the world. And so the uh, living in the Latino world was, was born in me in that time, but then that led me to go back to Chile and to Peru as a seminarian after I graduated college. And so it, by, uh, by extension of that, when I uh, was eventually ordained, I uh, wanted to work in Latino context. So I, I, I worked in Mexico and at the border of California and Mexico uh, in my pastoral ministry. And I was working in some migrant camps in Southern California. And I was uh, really also interested at the same time in, in the issue of spirituality. So I was interested in both the inner journey into the human heart, but the outer journey of peoples. So it was... Uh, it was kind of a complex space in, in the beginning because the people in the academic world, uh, or excuse me, the people in the migrant camps didn't care that I know, they just want to know that I cared. Whereas the people in the academic world didn't care that I cared, they just cared that I know. And so I was in between these two worlds, between the grassroots and the academy, and I wasn't really quite sure where I fit other than at the border. And it was uh, really finally sitting at that very fruitful place in between those worlds that led me to, to realize that migration itself was a theological concept. So in 2000, I came back to Notre Dame and my research area eventually became uh, looking at both the spiritual and theological dimensions related to migration, uh, which in time kind of led me to um, try to articulate um, a contextual theology or a theology of migration. And that is um, how we think about migration in theological terms. Uh, so what started as working with economic migrants coming out of Latin America eventually broadened out to working with refugees in the Middle East and also in Africa. So we worked with survivors of the Rwanda genocide, as well as folks uh, fleeing uh, mostly the Syrian refugee context. But, uh, but I do want to highlight one piece of this, and that is, you can see behind me, there's a picture of, of Pope Francis holding up a chalice that he uh, used when uh, he went to the island of Lampedusa and island of Lampedusa is off the boot of Italy. And he went there eight days after he heard of a shipwreck of a, of a group of refugees that were fleeing from the African coast. And these boats can pack in as many as, you know, seven, 800 people. And the boat capsized and only eight people survived. And they survived by clinging to a fishing net in the middle of the ocean. And when the fishermen saw these people clinging to nets, instead of saving them, they actually severed their nets and cast these migrants to die in the ocean depths. And Pope Francis was so moved by the indifference of these fishermen, and more broadly by the indifference of people to the deaths of so many people in the open seas, that he went down to this island of Lampedusa. He celebrated mass by an ocean, by the ocean harbor, and uh, he used a chalice that was made from the driftwood of a refugee boat. And so one of the questions that I would take up as a, as a theologian would be to say, what does it mean to use a chalice made from the driftwood of a refugee boat? And uh, that's really a question of how we think about the narrative of, of migration in light of the narrative of, of faith. And, and I think that's been part of my work is to try to really see how we can reshape that narrative 
uh, through the theological lens um, and really move us from a place of othering migrants and to look at our, our really journey towards communion and union. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. And I think that's something we talk a lot about in, in the Keo school too, of just recognizing that, you know, from a theological perspective or even a, a more secular, just the dignity of each person and each individual and, and how important that is just to recognize the humanness of each, of each individual, no matter their, their story. And I think that is something that, that gets lost a lot of times in, in all this. And so I think that's a, a great thing kind of just to keep us grounded and centered as we, as we think about these bigger issues, right. And as we try to address root causes and big systemic issues, and um, it kind of, it helps answer whether you're spiritual or not the, the, so what question in a lot of ways. Um, and so what is, I guess that kind of leads us to, you've been involved with, you know, the Vatican, the, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Notre Dame, and others who are responding in some way, shape, or form to the ebbs and flows of migration from Central America and elsewhere. You know, what what has the church been doing and what are they currently doing in response? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, on, on one level, there is a direct response to the needs of migrants and <clears throat> refugees around the world. And, and so we see even groups like Catholic Charities and Catholic Relief Services that are sort of the frontline workers that are providing direct aid to, to those who are suffering and those who are on the move, the move. So I think the first is looking at the direct response to migrants' needs. The second would be uh, looking more at those who are working in advocacy. Um, the work of the Bishops' Conference does a lot of behind the scenes work, working with politicians, trying to change legislation, trying to influence the way we think about this collectively. And uh, so there's a lot of structural work and legislative work that goes on there. Um, to really try to not only support organizations that are working directly with migrants, but also how we collectively organize as a society and how you create more just and humane legislation in the process. The thirdly would be through education and how we really uh, teach people about these subjects, how we really help people rethink how this issue uh, is affecting us and try to come up with, like at Keo, to come up with strategies around teaching people about these issues and trying to come up with more creative solutions. And the last and related piece would be research. And so how do we do research around these issues? And theology is kind of one of many disciplines that are studying it, but I, I do think one of the ways that it can contribute is, 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 is supporting those who are working in migrants and refugees and see this as a core dimension of uh, a faith response to the suffering of the world. But also I, I think uh, what's really at stake um, is coming up with a new narrative about migration and really challenging some of these dualized narratives of citizen, alien, native, foreigner, uh, illegal, illegal, all of which break down at some point when we look at them through the lens of human dignity, of human rights, um, and of trying to build a, a more just and humane society. So the church really, um, I think, is key to that. The bishops, interestingly enough, the, the, the United States have, has resettled more refugees than any other country in the world. The bishops have uh, resettled more refugees than any of the organization in the United States. And if you take just the work of the church alone in this issue, it'd be the second largest resettler of refugees in the world. So this is a, a huge contribution, I think, in terms of doing that. But, um, you know, at the same time, the, we, we have so much work to do. It feels like we haven't really done much at all. But I, I think it's an important voice in immigration reform. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Father. And I, I think we could dissect all those issues even, even further, but I do want to bring Dr. Dabu in here before time gets away from us. Um, and I think, you know, with you, Dr. Dabu, we've, we talk a lot, those of us in the international development space, about public-private partnerships and, and bringing in and activating the private sector, but there's already so much that's going on in the private sector in response to issues like um, the challenges facing Central Americans. Um, and we've seen kind of a growing role and a growing um, movement in that space that you're, you're definitely a part of. Um, you know, how did that, you know, where did this idea, you're, you're now leading this alliance of private sector actors um, in the United States and, and in Central America, where did that idea sort of come from and how did it, how did it all um, come to be? Thank you, Tom, and hello to everybody. Uh, I think that it is very important to recognize that 
there are push factors, which is what we have been talking about primarily, but there are also pull factors as to why people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, and for that matter, from Africa to Europe, et cetera, uh, are, are migrating to better countries. And if it is very important also to really understand the roots of the problem. And one very important component that has not yet been mentioned, and it is important to put it in the radar screen, is transnational criminal organizations that are using these three countries as a place from where drugs can navigate into the United States uh, and to foment other insecurity issues as well. So from where I stand, there are two things that need to be addressed as part of the root causes. One is insecurity, and the other one is the capacity for people to actually take destiny into their own hands. And that can only be provided through a job, a decent job that gives people not only the means to choose what they want to do, but also uh, the opportunity of educating their children, having a, a better health, et cetera. And so from that angle, um, I, you know, I come from the private sector. My family also migrated. They migrated from Palestine into El Salvador a hundred years ago. So they came with nothing. They didn't speak the language. They didn't have money. They didn't have friends yet they were able to make it. They were able to make it because they have the hunger, the appetite, the desire of making things happen. And that is what differentiates an entrepreneur and a person that perhaps is just waiting for a miracle to happen or for aid. And I think I work in 110 countries, all of Africa, the Middle East, East Asia, and Latin America. And the common denominator is that people are not expecting, are not waiting for a bag of food. They want a job. So the famous story of the fish, right? They don't want the fish. Uh, they uh, uh, want to be taught. They don't even need to be taught how to fish. They know how to fish. What they need is the freedom to be able to fish and the market where they can sell their fish. And so with that in mind, and having seen and having lived through many experiences during the armed invasion that took place in my country, where by the way, my brother was kidnapped 35 years ago. Uh, two of his children are there at Notre Dame today, a, a junior and a, and a senior. Uh, so every family in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador throughout history has suffered independently of in which side, quote unquote, of the spectrum you are. But that has also built a very resilient people who in spite of who is in government or in spite many times on the policies in place in the four countries, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and the United States, we have been able to survive, to keep moving forward and to create opportunities for many. And so what in my humble opinion has been missing, and it takes two to tango, so it's not one particular party's uh, responsibility, but what has been missing is the role, the more proactive role of the private sector. At the end of the day, uh, many of the things we are talking about require financing, require resources. No government is in the capacity to fix all the problems. It has to come from within the countries. And that, you know, when we talk also about, you know, redistributing the wealth, Yes, but let's create it first. And that's where the role of the private sector comes into play. So looking at what is happening in the border and realizing that there seems to be not enough uh, coordination or agreement on the US side to take all the actions that are necessary and, and that's understandable. So we, we, a group of people from the private sector ask ourselves, well, you know, we, we First, we shouldn't blame others for the problems that are ours. And two, we shouldn't be waiting for somebody else to resolve uh, our problems. We need to make things happen. And so in a similar way that we did at the time of CAFTA, when we negotiated a free trade agreement that has created millions of jobs, or when we did a project to invest in infrastructure from the southern part of Mexico to the northern part of Colombia in terms of transmission of electricity, when we were able to get together with the United States seated at the table, we were able to accomplish several things. So today we have a problem 
at the border that is exacerbated by many reasons. So we need, this is like a hemorrhage and you need a tourniquet. Many of the things that people are putting on the table will take five, 10 or a generation to be able to percolate and take effect. A job can be done almost immediately. And there is another factor today, which is the tension between the US and China provides the right scenario for many US companies based in China to move closer to home. And that is El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. You know, it is closer to fly from El Salvador to Miami than from Miami to Washington, DC, where I live today. And so if we take into account the near shoring opportunities, if we realize that um, creating jobs is one very important component of putting this tourniquet, we at HUGE, which stands for Honduras, the US, Guatemala, and El Salvador Business and Investment Council, we are proposing to precisely focus our energies in strategic projects. These are projects that cut across the different countries in infrastructure, in roads, in ports, in telecommunications, in energy that will help strengthen the platform upon which these nearshoring, these investments can take place and jobs be created. We believe that in a period of three to five years, 2 million new jobs can be created, 500,000 direct jobs and 1.5 million indirect jobs. And why is that important? On average, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, there are five people per family. If you, get a, if you give a job, a decent job, a well-paid job to one of the family members, potentially you are impacting five others that can make the American dream at home. And I finalize with one more data point. Uh, in my experience in the 110 countries that I had the opportunity of working for, there is sort of a magic number. And again, this changes from, from country to country, from region to region. But if when you reach $8,000 per capita income, immigration tends to uh, 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 stop. And in many countries, like it happened in Mexico a few years ago, it is immigration at the inverse. In other words, when Salvadorians, Guatemalan, and Hondurans reach $8,000 per capita income, the possibility of them looking for other places where to go will reduce significantly. And we will start to see many of those who live here from those three countries actually at the retirement age going back to our countries for healthcare reasons because they can own a home there uh, with all the resources they have made while here. And one final point, I said the last one was well, gonna be the last one, but that one more that I think is very important. As uh, some of the people in this conversation, uh, Michael and others who have an influence uh, and a say in, in the administration decisions and policies, I think one important issue to keep in mind as hopefully the dialogue on immigration policy in the United States evolves and hopefully some answers are put in place and implemented. One factor to keep in mind is that people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that want to come to the United States, A, are coming to fill up jobs that many people in the United States are not necessarily filling up. But two, and as important in the scope of what Father Grudy was saying, is that these are, in their great majority, Christians, family-oriented people. And so if, at a point in time, the US sets some kind of fixed number in terms of who and from where, I think I would strongly suggest that you do give some kind of privilege to put at the top of the list people from these three countries for those two factors, family value and Christianity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Debu. And I think that's you know one of the things that, that does get lost it, it, in the overall conversation is this role, this important role the private sector has in, in terms of jobs and, and the dignity of jobs and, and good quality jobs that, and the dignity that those jobs can provide. Uh, one of the questions that came in, we'll, we'll go straight to you with the, one of the first questions was, you know, a lot of the, the folks listening are, you know, work in the private sector in some way, shape, shape or form. What can they do? How can they get involved in, in what you're doing? Is there a, a 30 second answer to that? Yes, there is. And I already put the website in the, in the, in the same chat. Uh, 
the, the, the Think Huge initiative um, is open for uh, a, a people from the private sector of the four countries. We have several companies from the United States, like McKinsey, Citibank, Fruit of the Loom, uh, Pardale Mills. There are several companies that have joined this effort. And we are saying, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We have identified some $1.6 billion worth of investments and 40% of that is coming from the founders of HUGE. And so we can leverage those resources to provide critical, pragmatic solutions that in the short term, three to five years, can help put that tourniquet. And so I welcome, we at HUGE welcome, uh, especially students from Notre Dame that for us are the first that we like to hire because they bring two things, talent, and the uh, values and principles that we cherish a lot. Great, great, thank you. So yeah, check out that, uh, that link in the chat. Um, another question, and, and this is directed towards you, Michael, um, someone who, who just tuned into a lecture from Sean Callahan, who's a friend of, of ours, and he's the CEO of Catholic Relief Services. Um, and he discussed how in order to be able to scale projects and programs, um, CRS and others work with government officials and the local community to support, um, and, and they need that local community support, sort of the grassroots support that you were talking about um, to, to really succeed. Um, how, and, and I think the question gets at, you know, how are the grassroots and the, the governments um, working together or being noticed by each other um, in, in the region, in your experience, and, and maybe how could they do more, more work together the, between the civil society and governments? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, I mean, I think the, the short answer is probably, you know, not enough. Um, uh, maybe what I could speak to more than um, kind of what's happening between local civil society and, and, and governments in the region is what um, we're doing at USA to, to focus on this, because we are also in our own operations um, very much focused on trying to localize as much as possible our efforts, understanding that um, we need to provide local local communities and, and, and local actors ownership over uh, development programs, um, that, that our, our development interventions need to be informed by their lived experiences, by their expertise, by their understanding of what they're their communities need, um, but also that that you know they, they're there, right? They are um, USAID. You know, hopefully we'll be there tomorrow and the day after. You know, with luck we'll put ourselves out of business in, in Central America someday, the way that we have in uh, you know places like Costa Rica in the past. Um, uh, but these folks are going to be committed to their um, their, their communities um, for for the long term, and so we want to build as much capacity as possible. Um, through our programming as we can. And so one of the things we've been thinking through and the administrator, administrator Power is very, uh, very focused on this as, as is the vice president, um, just how we can kind of reform our, our internals um, at, at USAID um, to do as much of this uh, as possible. Um, and that's when I talk about local actors, you know, I'm, I'm talking about um, certainly civil society, but I'm talking about universities, might be the private sector, might be uh, faith-based organizations, right? The, the, the list is, is, um, is long and diverse, um, but the, the the basic point is that um, we really do feel like there's such strength of the human capital uh, in, in the region. I think Dr. Lu kind of spoke to this, and it just needs to be um, kind of empowered and, and provided the opportunity to um, to, to thrive. And, and so we want to make sure that um, we're being thoughtful about that uh, in the way that we operate in the region. And, and hopefully, going back to your question, um, in doing so, we then put those. Um, those same actors in a better position to engage their own political systems and their own governments. Great. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good way to answer it. And, and specifically and concretely, there's this whole new partnerships initiative within USAID to really, to, to reach out to, to groups that have not partnered with the agency and, and, and been involved in this work in the past. And so that's a great concrete way that, that you're putting into action what you're talking about. Um, another question, and this one kind of follows up on, um, on our past discussion with one of our adapter, Abby Cordova, at, here in Notre Dame, who's been doing our research, particularly on gender-based violence. Um, and so, and, and it came up actually in the discussion with her uh, about whether or not that 
um, was something that, that would impact asylum or humanitarian protection. So maybe as a follow-up to that, Theba, is there, you know, are there specific protections, either specific or general protections for someone who has suffered gender-based violence? I, I should mention, we also heard about it from Clara, one of our students who, who recounted the story of, of meeting someone just randomly, a, you know, a, another uh, a Salvadoran on the street, and they started exchanging their stories. And, and this woman spoke about her experience of gender-based violence and how she was hoping to seek legal protection because of it. So it seems like it's an increasing issue. It's one that USAID is working on. Um, but in particular, are there legal protections for, for victims of gender-based violence? Yes. Um, so that's been a, a kind of a roller coaster over the last seven years, you could say, uh, legally. You could, um, in 2014, there was an important case that was decided that involved a, a married Guatemalan woman who was unable to safely leave her relationship. And that you know, was was really important for all, all of us practitioners. We, I've used it. We've all, many of us have used it to win cases, win asylum for women who, uh, whether or not they were married, to be able to prove that they were in domestic relationships that the society recognized as, you know, that that they were unable to safely leave. Um, however, in 2018, uh, the you know, one of the prior attorney generals issued a decision to severely abrogate that, uh, that other decision. And, you know, now under the Biden administration, that attorney general opinion has been, you know, reversed as well. So it's, it's, so the women who may have been caught in the system over these years, um, maybe, you know, uh, getting denied because of the abrogation of their first case, you know, are going to be able to wind th through their cases, you know, on appeal and coming back down now that the the, the legal landscape is, has changed again back in their favor. Um, it's, it's never just a straightforward um, gender-based case. You know, it's um, it, it's very involved in 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 the in the very in the elements that one has to prove um, that you're still a member of a particular social group and what you know what are why is that the reason you know the central reason that you're fleeing. Um, you know, and the, why you can't be protected. So, you know, of course, the, all of the, the, the statistics on femicide in Central America are, are critical there. The Center for Gender and Refugee Studies is really important in, in the work that they're doing um, in, in gathering the expert opinions. Um, and, you know, like, like some of the work that I've seen from you, Tom, as well, you know, in terms of the, you know, documenting the reasons why uh, women are not safe. Uh, in particular, uh, so that's it's it's a developing area. Continue, you know, and and, and it faces its challenges um, with each administration. But you know, that's that's an area that people are continuing to push because it is it's so dangerous. Um, and and I've seen it not just in the in the domestic violence form. You can also see it in some of the, there's, there's this other, you know, the other GBV, the gang-based violence cases, one could say, but that often have a particular emphasis on or, or, or harm to women, you know, um, and, and so that's, that's another area where we've also, you know, been making inroads in trying to say that, you know, the women who um, can't leave uh, or, or, or somehow, you know, recruited as, um, as the property of these gang workers, you know, um, that they also are at risk. Um, so those are, you know, it, it, hopefully that kind of answers you that it's still developing, but it has significant challenges. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And it, yeah, it just shows again, like the level of complexity and, and, and the importance of people like you that are in, in there to help, you know, untangle all that um, day by day for, for, for victims as they go through the system to help hopefully prevent re-victimization, um, along the way. So, so thank you for that. Um, I want to point out that we're, we're at our time. I do want to go really briefly to Father Grudy, maybe to, to round us out and just ask the, the general question that seems to be a theme through some of these questions that are coming in is, you know, what, what can we all do? Um, what is, you know, as, as we leave here, with this new information and 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 what we what we're learning about migration and 
um, from no matter what our background is, faith tradition, whatever our career is, is there any one thing that you would sort of challenge us with as we leave here, Father? I, um, yeah, I just want to offer just one perspective as a, as a theologian on this and, and maybe a way to shape our consciousness about this. And that, that is, is that Jesus really is the uh, illegal alien of God. <laughs> And um, he was illegal because he was born outside of wedlock and he was an alien because he really was from another world. But he came to save an alien people who are separated from God from, by sin. And he really is the one who, through his death and resurrection, calls us to migrate back to our homeland. And so when we come to realize that God came as a migrant to our world in order to help us migrate back to our homeland, we realize that it's not about us and them, but it's about all of us. And they're really the long journey of human life is really about moving from otherness to oneness or from alienation to communion. And that's why, uh, you know, each year the bishops have a mass at the uh, Mexican border that uh, half the communities in Mexico and half the communities that in the United States, and they actually have a binational Eucharist. But it speaks to the communion that we're all called to. So I think one is to really understand our own identity as a migrant identity and that, um, that really the long journey of human life is about moving towards union and community. That's really what our, our lives are about. And how does that bear itself out in practice? Uh, through the works of mercy. And, and I think, how does that also concretize itself um, in terms of our relationships? How do we treat each other with dignity and respect, especially those that are marginalized and socially ostracized, as many uh, migrants and refugees are? So um, I think there's a lot that can be said about that, but I think it all rests on uh, of, of living lives of reverence and care and concern and realizing that we're on this journey together and God's with us and God calls us to really become a more visible presence of his invisible love for all of us. Thank you, Father. I'm, I'm glad I closed with you because I don't think I could have uh, put that all together or done, done some more eloquently. So thank you very much. And thank you to, um, to all of our panelists and, and discussants for joining us today and for their preparation and thinking about these, these issues in their careers and then as they as they do every day. Um, and thank you to, to all of uh, everyone who joined us um, online and, and throughout the series. Um, once again, on ThinkND, we have many different resources to help everyone explore the concepts we've discussed um, over the past several weeks. Um, so be sure to check those out. Um, obviously, this, you know, the topic of migration isn't going anywhere. Um, and so it's an immense challenge. Um, and, and as we've explored over these past few weeks, it's being worked on from various different angles. Um, and as, you know, as Father mentioned, I think keeping the, the dignity of each individual in mind um, is the one way that we'll sort of see our, see our way through this um, and, and really, you know, work to work with um, others to make uh, life, uh, to, to promote flourishing wherever we are. Um, and so thank you, thank you for joining us on that, on that journey. And if you're interested to learn more um, uh, about our work at the Pulte Institute and especially in the Central America Research Alliance at Notre Dame, um, please visit our website um, or you can feel free to reach out to me directly, thair at nd.edu. Um, I think there's a link in the chat to our website there as well. Um, and once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our panelists from the past set sessions. And um, thank you all for joining us on this virtual journey. It's been an honor uh, to put this series together, and I hope to connect with everyone again in the future. Take care. Very much.